Uh, all right. Welcome to our speaker series. I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, our speaker tonight, or today, this afternoon, is Professor Jagdish, Jagdish and Chef. He's the Charles H. Kelstadt Professor of Business in the Goizeta Business School at Emory University. He is globally known for his scholarly contributions in consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strategy, and geopolitical analysis. Professor Schaff has over 50 years of combined experience in teaching and research at the University of Southern California, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Columbia University, MIT, and Emory University. Professor Schaff is the recipient of all four top awards given by the American Marketing Association, the Richard D. Irwin Distinguished Marketing Educator Award, the Charles Coolidge Parlin Award for Market Research, the P.D. Converse Award for Outstanding Contributions to Theory and Marketing, and the William Wilkie Award for Marketing for a Better Society. Professor Sheff is a Fellow of the Association of Consumer Research, Fellow of the American Psychological Association, Fellow of the American Marketing Association, Distinguished Fellow of the Academy of Marketing Science, and a Distinguished Fellow of International Engineering Consortium. <clears throat> Professor Schaff is a recipient of an honorary doctorate in science awarded by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, an honorary doctorate of philosophy awarded by Shiv Nadar University. Professor Schaff has authored or co-authored more than 300 papers and several books, including Clients for Life, The Rule of Three, Tectonic Shift, Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies, Chindia Rising, The Four A's of Marketing, Firms of Endearment, Breakout Strategies for Emerging Markets, The Sustainability Edge, and Genes, Climate, and Consumption Culture, Connecting the Dots. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Sheth. Well, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? More importantly, can you see me also? <laughs> this is the joke only for short people, right? Um, how old do you think I am? Make a guess. 25. <laughs> My grandchildren are older than that, okay? So, okay. Higher than 25, please. 50? Yeah, doubling the whole thing. 57. <laughs> uh, I just turned 80, 80. No, do I look, do I look 80? No. Uh, that's because I'm in marketing, okay? So if you know in marketing, the first thing we learn and teach, it's all about packaging. So that's my background. I came to the States in 1961 as a foreign graduate student to do my MBA. I'm in the business school. Turn around and actually after my MBA, I went into psychology and I came primarily understanding psychology of customers, which is my background. So that's what I do. And at a very young age, 1963, I became a professor at Columbia University. At that time, there are not too many scholars from India. I was the only one actually in the whole school of business in New York City. And they said, we don't know how to pronounce your name, so we'll call you Jag, like in Jaguar. And ever since that association, I've been dreaming of owning a Jaguar with a license plate, Jag's Jag, right? <laughs> and the dream became a reality 20 years ago when I turned 60. I have two grown-up children, both married, and they surprised me on my birthday. I don't count my birthdays. I come from the old generation. So it was Saturday morning, usually around Labor Day weekend, and I went out, got my newspaper, and turned around and saw this beautiful Jaguar, top of the line, XJ model, even the color I like, parked in the driveway with a handwritten license plate, Jag Jag, happy 60th birthday. It turned out to be a rental car. <laughs> so I'm still looking for my Jaguar. Since this is a global academy, it has a very interesting message because 
Jaguar, as you know, was the state car for the British Empire, which was the biggest and the longest surviving empire. And all of the diplomatic uh, receptions, etc., will be official car will be Jaguar. Like for us, it will be Cadillac. Used to be Mercedes Benz for Germans, for example. And uh, it is now owned by an Indian automobile maker. Isn't that interesting? 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you would have never thought that an emerging economy and a former colony would own large enterprises all over the world. That's true of China, that's true of India, so the world is changing enormously. My presentation is not on that globalization, which I can do also, but we'll have Q&A. But my presentation is more about the strategic importance of the city, Atlanta. And I've done an enormous amount of advising to the Singapore government to reposition itself, and we are following a similar process around here. How many of you know the old name for Atlanta? What was the original name for the city? Yes, Terminus. And the reason why it is Terminus because different railways in those days, they allowed private sector. Each railway had their own meter gauge, narrow gauge, broad gauge. You need to exchange, let's say, from the port of Savannah to come over here. All the goods, they'll be unloaded and reloaded on another railway line owned by somebody else to go to Mississippi River. And that's very interesting background. So it always had a strategic location advantage. And that's what we are trying to promote very heavily, that city of Atlanta can aspire to be a global hub, not just a regional hub, which is how it grew at one time. So I will make a quick presentation, open up for Q&A. Q&A can be on any topic related to globalization, not just on Atlanta. So if it's okay, let me just go through some of the quick slides. So how can Atlanta aspire to be a global hub? Atlanta has all the ingredients. This is what I found when I came here in 1991 as a professor at Emory University. And by the way, I would say, please apply to Emory University. It's a great place. Whether you want to be pre-law, pre-medicine, pre-anything. And our BBA is very high standard. Our internal transfer after two years, minimum now is 3.75 GPA at Emory, which is pretty high, high requirement. It's a very good school. And I'm very pleased to be here. I came in 1991 here after teaching at MIT, Columbia, Illinois, USC in California, and I came here, and this is a great place for me. So Atlanta, I've been watching as a city from 27 years now. So I found that it has all the ingredients, but no recipe. And recipe, what is a recipe? For a nation or a city, the recipe is a vision. And it's execution on that vision, similar to what Singapore has done, Las Vegas has done surprisingly from a gambling city to a convention city. Hong Kong is doing very well after the integration. Orlando is no longer Disney World alone, but it is actually a major uh, tourism place, not only tourism, but also a convention place. And now they are attracting more corporate headquarters there. Fascinating. London has always done a great job of transforming itself constantly. And London is a very fascinating city to see its history. Iceland as a country, nothing but rugged mountains, and all of a sudden Iceland has become a major tourist place. And now they're finding that from tourism, they would like to be one of the places to make movies or entertainment, just like New Zealand has done the same thing. And of course, New Zealand, I just talked about that one. So what's a vision? Vision is inspirational. It always inspires people to do more than what they can do. It's always in the future. And it is very proactive. It is not something like, let the gods bless us. You intervene, you take charge, and shape the future of the city. And of course, it is, has always a passion. People get excited about going in that journey that you create for them, a vision that you can create for them. By the way, this is something you might have studied in your high school classes. Civilizations have been never around the nations. Civilizations always have been around cities. There is Venice, but no Italy. There is Rome, but no Italy. Think about that too. All over the world, civilizations are at cities, mostly on river flows, 
and mostly it is first organized by commercial people who come and make money, merchant community primarily. They are like trading posts in the old native Indian trails, for example, from here to the west coast, especially northwest. And once the trading community, merchant class, begins to make good money in that city, they begin to attract arts and culture. Every city has gone through that process. And of course, Italy has many good cities like that, that when we have Florence is in that category. Uh, as I said, Venice is in that category. So cities are very important. And generally, you want to think global, but you have to act locally. And how do you position yourself for the future? So here are the ingredients for Atlanta as a city. In many ways, Atlanta is about 50% Georgia anyhow. So this becomes Georgia. First of all, it is a very good strategic location. I don't have to have two corporate headquarters, one in New York and one in Toronto for North America, one in Miami, which is a de facto capital for Latin America or a Panama country. I can have just one place and I can manage the whole Western Hemisphere. So many foreign companies are now locating here rather than having two headquarters, they can now have managed the whole thing in one headquarters. Delta Airlines is a very key architecture because you can have flights from Europe, for example, or even from Asia, land here and you can go to Latin America. It's a major hub from that viewpoint. It is a strategic location. I will elaborate on all this as we go along. Fantastic digital talent. It has four major universities here, three in the city alone, and of course Athens on the other side. And we have then in addition to that many vocational technical universities, and we are generating enormous number of people who are very good with digital technologies in general. Very affordable city. For major cities, it is still very affordable compared to, let's say, anything in New Jersey, New York area, Boston, for example, San Francisco. It's quite good. Government is business friendly. Business is welcome here. So you have seen recently, Porsche has put its headquarters here for Western Hemisphere. Mercedes-Benz moved from New York, New Jersey. NCR, a great corporation from Dayton, Ohio. I can give you names and all of a sudden now, all the Silicon Valley companies, Google, Microsoft, etc., West Coast companies are having a major hub that is hubbing now in Atlanta because they can't afford to have more people come to California or Washington, Oregon, etc. Very fascinating change. Surprisingly, it's a very diverse city, which people don't think about it. But given the civil rights movement around here, very, much, very well accepted African American community as leaders of the city and the nation for that matter. If you talk to President Carter, he always has praised that he would have never made as a president, I'm sorry, he would have never made as a president without the support of the African American population, which is a very key political process also. And so you have a huge diversity of all kinds of ethnic people around here not in size like Los Angeles, for example, or New York, but it has all cultures around here. Asian cultures are very big nowadays. So is, of course, the Hispanic culture. There are 70 consulates around here in this city. So it has all of the architecture to have a diversity and still believes in having a unity among the diversity of the people, which is a very good asset that one can leverage. As you can see right now, what is happening with the Super Bowl, for example, as you can see what is happening with um, uh, the Olympics when we hosted that in 1996. I was here at that time. And the last one is that it is a fantastic physical infrastructure, highways, etc. but more importantly, digital infrastructure. There was a telephone company here called Bell South, which is part of AT&T now. And Bell South put more fiber optics in this city than any other city in the Southeast. Today, therefore, we are like the largest payment gateway for any online transactions that you do. All the payment processing is done here in Atlanta. About 70% of the world payment systems are all done around here. So it has many hidden ingredients which one can leverage to create a recipe. So here are the things. It's a historic function. was a terminus. From railways, it became a highway when the highways were built, interstates, for trucks. Now, of course, the airways. Delta is a major presence, this airport. 
Um, we already talked about the digital talent. So let me just go over all of this stuff that I've talked about. So I'll just pass them rather than go into the details. So this is what we are thinking about repositioning Atlanta. From a regional hub to a global hub, first of all, but more importantly, Atlanta was a low-wage economy, mostly manufacturing or chicken capital of the world in many ways, where you do not earn as much wages. And today, in the digital world, it is becoming more and more high-wage economy. So hourly wages you calculate, pretty much. So how can we go from $25 to $75, $80 per hour, which gets into more professional activities as opposed to physical activities? So here are the areas that the city is focusing. We are recommending to focus, first of all, this has become the entertainment capital of the world. It surpassed Hollywood, which is unthinkable. 9.5 billion economic impact in 19, there's a typo, 2017, okay? It's a global movie production hub just like Seoul, Korea is, London, Mumbai, which is called Bollywood, which is a very big, largest movie producer in the world is India, actually, in terms of number of films it produces, great talent. Toronto is coming out. Wellington, I visited Wellington in New Zealand, is becoming, Lord of the Rings is the way they began, is becoming a major movie production hub in the world. So we need to align with the rest of the movie capitals of the world and we are becoming dominant one. It's very fascinating. This is not done by local companies. Pinewood Studios is a British company, and they have a major studio presence in South because we have a large land, very affordable land. You need a big sort of a movie production set, by large, like California that you can see, or uh, Disney you can see, which is fascinating. And most of the Marvel movies would be made here. Uh, Black Panther has done very well, 80-90% was all done within the state of Georgia primarily. There is enough talent from North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, who all hubs together because movies mostly a gig economy as they call it or a contract work. You're not employees, you're brought together by a project and the project is over, you're back to wherever you are. And the Pinewood Studios in Atlanta is one million square foot. 74 different stages. Total, not, not Atlanta, but this is the size of the Pinewood Studios which are making the difference around here. It is also going to become an automobile capital of the world. Detroit was the last century where the mass production began, assembly line principle, Henry Ford, you have studied all this stuff. Now Detroit being replaced by Atlanta. Again, not by General Motors or Chrysler or Ford, but by five German automobile makers all hubbing in the southeast. If you look at the architecture, and this is the de facto city as a capital, not all plants are in Detroit, but they are in Michigan, for example. Some are in Illinois or Indiana. It's the same way around here. So Mercedes-Benz plant in Alabama. You have the plant in Greenville, South Carolina for BMW. Porsche is right here around here, which is interesting. German car makers are very key. And today, automobile is not metal bending anymore. The largest cost in making automobiles are chips and software. And we are very good about software side, chips can be imported. So it's suddenly becoming a major, major hub worldwide. So Koreans are coming and we think eventually China will come here. China is a large, large consumer of automobiles, but they're also making automobiles. Volvo is their brand, for example, and they will come and hub here. Third one is, it's very key capital for health sciences. We do 3,000 clinical trials in this city alone. My university does 1,000 of the 3,000 clinical trials. Large medical device makers such as Siemens, Philips, and CR Bar, they're all located here. CDC, you have to visit CDC, it is World Class Centers for Disease Control, which does all the like Ebola trials, for example, finding something for cure for Ebola. Emory is a very big one in medical school. And we have a program with Georgia Tech, which is bioengineering, five years program. You join Georgia Tech, for example, and last two years you come to Emory to do your biological science. So number one in the country, out of nowhere, that's very interesting. Fourth area is what is known as smart agriculture. 
Agriculture is getting totally intelligent now. You are embedding technologies after technologies, and this is a major agricultural state, especially forestry. All the paper mills hub here because we have the paper pulp. It also has a K line, which is a whitening stuff that you need to create paper in a usable form. And therefore, paper, agriculture, biomass, everything is happening, which is fascinating. And one of the key areas, of course, is water conservation, very key issue, and alternate energy. So this is one more area that the state is trying to figure out to make sure it's not just Atlanta-centric, but also Georgia-centric. Tech services, we are one of the largest, as I told you, in fintech payments. IT services, very large. IBM, Accenture, five major Indian IT sort of outsourcing companies are all here in a big presence. And of course, we are very large in legal and financial services. So one of the areas you are saying is that how can we get into professional technical services as positioning the future and then align with the other cities in the world which are also like Bangalore in India would be in that category, Shanghai would be in that category, in China for example, you can architect. So it's a connection by cities by cities, not countries by countries. And this we are also becoming a very large R&D hub, creating new knowledge, breakthroughs, discoveries, etc. Uh, and we are a global R&D hub for software, pharmaceuticals, I was very surprised about that one. Uh, Alibaba and Tencent are the kinds of companies that are likely to target this city. They are both, as you know, Chinese corporations and Japanese multinationals are already here in Peachtree City, but they are coming back again, especially in the uh, R&D area. Last one is private banking. We have the stock market, which is New York-centric, London, etc. Then you have the debt market, as it is called, which is the credit market. But the biggest growth around here is what is known as private equity market. Wide open field right now, so we think we can do that thing. In Singapore, this is what I've done. Singapore is a small island. There's nothing there. Just like Dubai, small place, nothing there. But strategic location. The government wanted to have it as a manufacturing capital, but to succeed in manufacturing, you have to have low cheap labor, there's no cheap labor anymore in Singapore. Some raw material that you can do value add by doing manufacturing on that one. Or in fact you have to have a large market. So this project in the 90s when we did, we made Singapore from a manufacturing capital to a distribution capital. Four flows, flow of products. So Singapore Seaport Authority, we wrapped up big wage number one now. Actually, Chinese couple of ports have just taken over Singapore position. Rotterdam always was the undisputed port worldwide for many, many years in Netherlands. We benchmarked that and surpassed that. Singapore is now a major hub. Flow of people. Changi Airport is world class and captured the north-south traffic from Australia New Zealand, which had aligned for their future no longer with America or with, in fact, Britain, where they come from originally, but with Asia. So New Zealand, Australia, all the traffic by flying, you hub it in uh, Singapore, which has done very well. Flow of information, which they already knew quite well, and the last one is the flow of capital. Private equity, as it is called, is hubbing primarily in that area. We can do the same thing around here. It's called a Swiss model because Switzerland as a country was very good in precision instruments on the one hand, like watches or machinery, but very big in private banking primarily. That's very fascinating. So we think that this is a possibility around here. So how do you execute on this aspiration? First of all, people just don't know. By the way, all great cities are made not by natives, but outsiders. Just keep that comment in the back of your mind. All great cities are not made by natives, they're made by See, immigrants, and for Atlanta, immigrants can be from Florida, Alabama, New York, not foreign countries. Every city that you analyze, you can see that pattern. So increase the awareness about how great this city's potential is through social media and publicity, because locals don't know how great it is. Link cities around focal areas, as I mentioned, for example, London for financial markets, Seoul, Korea for entertainment, 
by the way, one of the key countries for entertainment, number three or four in the world in production of movies, is actually Nigeria, which surprised me. Japan always was very big till India took over. Italy was big at one time. But actually, India is very large, but Nigeria is one of the big, big movie producers. So is China. China is the largest consumer of movies today. Every Hollywood movie depends on Chinese market, which they add things that we don't see around here to please the Chinese population or appeal to them. But more importantly, they are now going to come worldwide, another industry where China will dominate uh, in, in terms of movie production. That will be like the Hollywood of tomorrow. That's very interesting. Target incentives for each focal area. You see, movie industry is made by giving tax credits. And they're coming over here because of that, which is very, very lucrative incentive, actually. Think global, act local. Which means there's a global scenario out there, and we have a local advantage, primarily. Olympics all over, as I call it. We have a very strong civil rights legacy. One looks upon the city as...